so it's great to be here and great to be able to open uh, this very exciting uh, gathering and meeting where we hear about all the interesting results from Alma. And I, I was, it, it's, it's great to be able to share some ongoing results that we're obtaining with this Rebels Alma Large program. Um, so I'll uh, just, uh, just like to quickly thank all the people in Leiden. So this is my uh, cover slide where I show a lot of the co-PIs. It's an international effort. Lots of people, you know, both Chile, Japan, uh, the, J Japan uh, the United States, um, lots of people uh, on the team have contributed. Also, I'd like to highlight the people in who been who are in Leiden or who, who have been in Leiden, indicated by some of the red highlighted names. Um, okay, so uh, let me just uh, uh, launch into this. Um, so a lot of this work, uh, just before getting into this, just like to say that a lot of this is built on um, some very exciting thesis work that Renska Schmidt uh, did years ago, and uh, not only building on the work that she did uh, constraining the redshifts of objects using uh, Spitzer photometry and strong nebular emission lines, but also very exciting nature paper where um, she used uh, we used uh, some of the uh, pilot programs to this technique to to, to essentially uh, blindly find redshifts, spectrally scan for redshifts, and also present some exciting rotation, uh, probable rotation in two redshift seven galaxies. So um, just wanna also highlight um, Morrow and Sander who have also played a big role in this program. Um, so uh, why would you wanna have a large program to probe the buildup of massive galaxies in the early universe? Um, so what, a major question is, is how rapidly did these massive galaxies um, build up in the early universe? And um, you, uh, you can get some sense of how rapidly uh, stars and galaxies build up just by looking at the cosmic star formation rate, uh, star formation history. Uh, um, basically, there's, um, you know, basically in this cosmic star formation history, basically the, this, this history reaches a peak about 3 billion years after the Big Bang. So galaxy formation happens relatively rapidly. You can also find these massive QSOs, uh, quasars, uh, you know, as early as 700 million years after the Big Bang. So this, you know, shows that black holes and likely galaxies build up very, very rapidly. So, um, so you know, so there's a question about how, uh, how, how, how rapid the galaxies can build up, um, you know, in the early universe. It, se it seems to be very rapidly. Another thing is um, uh, dust build up in the early universe. Uh, how rapidly does this occur? And there's been some very exciting um, detections already with ALMA with uh, basically a a uh, bit more than a 10 sigma detection at redshift 7.15 and uh, another almost eight sigma detection at redshift 8.3. So there's been some very exciting results already. Um, so this is a very interesting question, how, how rapidly can that build up? And also what can we learn about the, uh, you know, about the, uh, the these massive galaxies? Let's see, just, um, can't even, oh, let's see, sorry. I'm just trying to fix my zoom. See here. Sorry, just um, I'm, I basically can't see my I can't see my own slides. So, okay. So let's. Okay. Um, what insights can we gain to the most massive collapsed galaxies from their dynamical states? Um, also, um, what can we learn about the metallicities, radiation fields, masses, etc. of these objects? Well, a very powerful tool to to go about doing this is Alma. Um, it's been long promised to be able to do great work in this uh, in this in this regard. Um, to, to observe the ISM, to observe I, uh, obscured star formation, dust. Uh, it's a very nice diagram of um, the, what you can observe in, in terms of an SED of distant galaxies um, to the upper right of this uh, figure. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, in the upper right part of this figure, you can see a, a prominent dust continuum and also a number of ISM cooling lines. And so AMA can really give us access to this to this longer wavelength part of the spectrum where we can get access to this cooling lines plus the, the dust continuum giving us. And so there's a lot of things we can do this from the detection of the dust continuum um, that you can see with ALMA, you can basically probe dust buildup and obscured star formation. Um, if you can actually succeed with ALMA in detecting any of these lines, some of the most prominent being C plus and O3, um, you can actually derive spectroscopic redshifts and uh, learn things about the dynamics. And basically by measuring line ratios and having multiple line detections, you can uh, probe, probe physical properties like metallicity, um, uh, learn about the um, you know, ionization conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the th this is the theoretical promise of, of, of ALMA for distant galaxies. 
Um, and so this is a, this has been something that's been very exciting. People have been talking about this for many years. And so, uh, so while this is a, an, an interesting theoretical question, um, you know, over the last, uh, you know, many 10 years, we've been able to try to see how effectively this works. Can we efficiently detect these lines and probe obscured star formation? So um, in the many, the first uh, th uh, th uh, two to five years of ALMA, people, um, the, 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 the field was relatively conservative. People would focus on things with spectroscopic redshifts at high redshift, oftentimes, almost always from Lyman alpha. And this produced a few of some exciting results, but they were based upon relatively small and biased samples. And some of the ISM cooling lines like C plus weren't always that bright. And so um, basically we thought, well, can there be another way of doing this? Are there other galaxies out there that we could potentially target efficiently with ALMA besides say those with Lyman alpha redshifts? Um, and so we basically um, pioneered this uh, a, a, a new approach where we uh, submitted a number of proposals where we thought, okay, another way of doing this is to focus on galaxies where very accurately constrained redshifts, uh, based basically focus on those galaxies with these strong nebular emission lines which appear in these spitzer irac bands. Um, just small changes in redshifts can have very profound impact on the colors as these lines move in and out of bands. We can use this kind of, it can use this as a way of, of looking very, very efficiently for these lines. Um, ALMA has a limited bandwidth and so it can be challenging to find these lines without spending huge amounts of time. And so after a few cycles, it took a while because the ALMA attack didn't immediately want to bite. We eventually got a C rank program uh, through and you know, not a very high rank program, but we focused on two bright galaxies. And from those two bright galaxies, uh, we got these really huge, uh, you know, very significant and very bright emission lines, you know, uh, which uh, resulted in a nature paper for Renska. She did a lot of the work, was very exciting uh, results. And it, it, so that was one exciting result. Then we, we, we basically put it, submitted another program with, with Sander and we, Sander Schaus, and we basically found three other bright lines. And what was amazing about this is we had found three of the, five of the most, uh, six most luminous gal, uh, C plus lines at redshift 6.6, .6, at least in normal galaxies. If you talk about quasars, a lot of those have all bright lines too, but these are normal galaxies. We had five of the six most luminous lines and we only had spent like 12 hours of alma time on it. So we thought, okay, let's put in a large program. And that's what we did. Um, we uh, submitted a, a, a large program where we thought, let's, let's, let's make statistical samples. Let's, let's, let's identify large numbers of galaxies to, to draw conclusions about how massive galaxies build up. So we constructed this sample of 40 particularly bright galaxies. Um, we basically constructed it over an area of using data that covered basically seven square degrees using uh, some of the best HST um, data sets and also a uh, ground-based wide area um, uh, near infrared plus uh, Spitzer uh, fields with huge amounts of optical and near infrared data and finding the best candidates. And we had we had three three people independently go out there and look for candidates and um, you know cross check each other's list. And so we eventually went through and we basically looked for those galaxies where basically everyone using independent photometry and independent constraints basically uh, derived a very similar similar values for the the redshifts of the objects. And so then we we based upon this as consensus list of objects, we constructed the sample. Um, basically the, the red cur curves show you the uh, rebel sample and the black show you some of the existing uh, sources with uh, where, where we had information from ALMA uh, from the literature. So we were, with this rebel program, our intention was to substantially increase the number of sources um, in the literature. Um, and so in constructing our program, we had to decide which lines to scan for. Um, basically, um, there are some very, there's several bright lines which uh, people have found in these distant galaxies, C plus, uh, okay, let's see, C plus and O3. Um, these, these, these are probably the easiest lines to find in these distant galaxies. Um, uh, these, uh, here are two lines that were found through spectral scans, both by Renska and by um, Takuya Hashimoto. And um, we found uh, we found that basically that uh, we could construct this pro we can, the, mo the most efficient program by at low for the low redshift end of our sample we would scan for C plus, and at the high redshift end we would end up um, employing a O3 scan. Um, so this plot here basically shows you the luminosity ratio 
um, it shows you uh, basically for what luminosity ratio uh, various scans are more efficient. And what you find is that basically as you go to higher redshift, um, basically there's a much larger fraction of the sources would be uh, more efficiently, redshift you get much more efficiently with O3 than C+. So then what we ended up having to do was basically construct, uh, we, we ended up constructing these uh, spectral scan strategies. Um, uh, so yeah, so basically, um, well, that's, I guess it shouldn't say scan windows, it say setups. So um, for some sources, we uh, constructed the, uh, the, the, red, the redshift likelihood, uh, the, the redshift photometric uh, likelihood distribution. Um, this just shows you the redshift probability distribution. And I show the spectral setups on top of this. Um, and what you can see is that for some sources, we could pr pretty much probe the entire uh, redshift likelihood distribution with just two setups. Um, and uh, for other sources, we had to use more setups. So uh, the one on the left, basically two setups is fine. The one on the right, three setups. And so we ended up, for all these 40 objects, we ended up setting up um, a bunch of spectral, uh, a set, set of spectral span windows to try to cover the whole range. The source, we don't completely cover the whole range. Some sources are more, have more uncertain redshifts. So we had to essentially uh, use many more spectral scan windows. So how, the, how have the observations gone? Um, well, the program is, uh, I think, in terms of clock time, we're about 90% through the program, 85 to 95%, I mean, 85 to 90%. Um, uh, in terms of the, 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 the this is the initial uh, redshift distribution of the sources. We have 33 out of the 40 fully observed, and we have seven sources where we, where we have some observations, but not all the observations. We have some observations for all sources. So, um, uh, we're complete for 33 out of 40 sources. And so what are the, how, what, how have the results been? Well, it's been very exciting. We've gotten very, a huge number of line detections, um, some very, very significant. I'll just show you some of the lines that we've been able to detect um, with this program. Um, just showing you in red basically shows you the lines. I mean, a lot of these lines are at least 10 sigma. And this just shows you um, uh, some of the line detections we have. Um, so you can see that yeah, a lot of exciting results from the program. Um, so um, at this point, you could ask, what, you know, how many detected lines do we have, C plus lines? We've also searched for O3, but we don't have any detections yet. Um, so we've mostly been just successful finding C plus. Um, so um, out of 33 fully scanned sources, we have 24 detected lines. At, uh, with a significance of more than four and a half sigma. Um, we have uh, 22 sources where the signal to noise is greater than five. Um, and you can see that, um, that yeah, that the, the signal to noise extends quite high. I guess I cut off the plot. There's one with even greater than 30. So again, there's a uh, you know, huge number of very significantly detected sources. Um, Amazing, we have three sources where we've actually gotten three uh, serendipitously detected sources where we find C plus in a, in a in neighbor. So that's actually 27 lines. One line we're still evaluating. So, you know, could be as much as 28. So we have 27 to 28 sources already detected. And we still haven't finished scans of seven sources. So, you know, we could have an even larger set of samples. Amazingly, for the sources where we've completed our scans, we have a 72% scan success rate for finding a C plus. So if we include the results from the pilots, we have anywhere to 32 to 33 C plus lines. Um, so how do the one question you might ask is how how well do the uh, the the redshifts that we derive from C plus compare to the photometric redshifts that we have got from the photometry? Um, here's a comparison of uh, of the results. Um, here, here's basically, uh, you can see that they agree pretty well um, overall with some slight scatter. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, with uh, the spectroscopic redshifts on average being slightly smaller, slightly lower and sl slightly lower in redshift. Um, so what is the, uh, which, what redshifts do we uh, recover, red distribution recover? So I show you the photometric redshift distribution that we input. And the red shows the spec Z uh, redshift distribution we get from um, basically from C plus. We have one uh, o potential O3 detection, which is around five, a little bit more than five sigma, which this is shown with the open red square. We would actually need to get more data on that to, to try to, um, to, to, to confirm it. And the, the ones at the highest redshift are, are unfortunately not fully observed. So we're still hoping that we can get some sources at redshift um, greater than eight. 
So another question you might ask at this point is, um, so do we understand at this point which sources we detect in C plus? I mean, um, we I said we for the sources we finished, we have a, a greater than 70% uh, detection rate. So do we understand uh, you know, which sources show up? Well, we've actually been able to assess this and this shows there are um, current results. Basically found that uh, whether something is detected or not is basically a, effectively a strict a function of the total star formation rate of the sources, which isn't very surprising because of the C plus uh, luminosity star formation relation. So basically what we find is that basically sources with uh, uh, star formation rates based upon their uh, you know, UV, rest of UV photometry and their uh, whether they uh, far infrared far infrared data, whether they have a dust detection or not, basically that this is a very good predictor for which sources we'll detect in C plus. So if they have star formation rates in excess of 60, we will detect them. And if they have less than uh, 60, uh, we won't detect them. Um, you can also look at how well, um, okay, so yeah, so and essentially all these sources that we detect in C plus are detecting the dust continuum. Um, you can also look at um, basically, um, this is a function of the rest UV or uh, unobscured star formation rates. So this is the unobscured star formation rates. Um, and this shows you how, uh, how well this works. And if you look at this, basically what you can see is that um, the basically um, for the, the brightest sources in the UV, we, we tend to detect all of those um, in C+. However, once you go below 40 solar masses a year, um, a modest fraction of those sources um, remain undetected. And those are uh, uh, basically sources where um, we don't get, we don't, they're, they're not especially bright in the UV. And uh, basically, we also don't get a dust detection. So the sources where we don't find C, um, likely well, that's because C is just too faint. So C, we, we scan for C, but it's not bright enough to detect. So um, how, um, so, the, so one another question you might ask is how significantly have um, our samples improved um, the, 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 the set of lines, C, bright C plus lines that are known in the high redshift universe. And here I show you the luminosity of C plus versus redshift and show you um, results uh, that have been obtained um, from other programs besides our own um, available in the literature. So these are basically um, other work from other teams. Um, so how, how have results from the Rebels program and the pilots improved the situation? So basically this shows you uh, what we've been able to add um, from this. And uh, what you can see is that uh, we've uh, substantially um, added to the number of, of, of you know, C plus lines, especially luminous C plus lines at high redshift. So at redshift greater than 6.6, .6, uh, there's large numbers of massive galaxies or massive ISM reservoirs we've been able to identify with this program. Um, um, this program is also has been really great for measuring spectroscopic redshifts. Um, uh, it's been very challenging to get spectroscopic redshifts for distant galaxies, and essentially the only line people have been able to use is uh, the Lyman Alpha line. Um, in the black, the, the, the gray points show you uh, basically photometrically identified distant galaxies, and the black, black uh, solid uh, squares um, the big, big points basically show you the sources with spectroscopic redshifts from Lyman Alpha or Brake. This shows you how much we've added to uh, what's available in the literature as of a few a year or two ago, um, basically from by based upon our program, um, and it's pretty substantial. You know, we've substantially by essentially using Alma, we've been able to you know just uh, 70, 80 hours with Alma, we've been able to you know substantially improve the number of redshifts which are available in the distant universe. So, in parallel with um, our work with Alma. Um, some members of our team have been essentially targeting sources in our program, uh, searching for Lyman Alpha. Um, and um, remarkably, um, there's been a number of Lyman Alpha lines found. I think we have at least five Lyman Alpha detections for uh, sources in our program so far. Um, this is a, a nine sigma detection of Lyman Alpha um, in our, from our program from MMT BinoSpec. Um, this work is being done by Ryan Ensley. Um, uh, there's a lot, we have a lot more um, uh, data coming in. Um, this just shows you some of the uh, follow-up data that we've been obtaining. Um, basically, uh, we've had at least five and a half, more than five nights with BinoSpec. Uh, we have a 58-hour X-Shooter program, uh, and we have basically um, 
we've basically have eight nights of moss fire time and we've already one of those nights we've already been able to detect lime and alpha in a redshift 7.677 source um, already and uh, so yeah, we there's all there's been at least five detections of lime and alpha already, and we're also looking for other rest UV lines to look um, to try to uh, learn about the the the, the radiation fields in these objects. Um, we've also been um, comparing, and this is still ongoing work, um, looking at comparing the uh, C plus and dust morphologies relative to the UV. Um, this shows you um, the, on the left you can see a montage of a lot of the different lines. You can see the structure in the lines. And then these other panels, you can actually see the redshifts, and you can uh, the uh, uh, and the uh, the images that have there. Those are, are basically rest UV. They're near infrared data, sometimes from space, from HST, and sometimes from the ground. And uh, the orange contours show you uh, the dust uh, dust continuum, and the blue are C plus. So what we've been doing is getting uh, C plus morphologies and uh, rest UV morphologies, and we're in a process of comparing them, looking for spatial offsets, and trying to understand what's going on. Um, here's 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 a, here's a, a, a number of other sources. These are somewhat lower signal to noise uh, sources, um, and basically um, you can see you can again look at a lot of the same features. Um, some of the uh, some of the structure in some of these objects is quite rich. Um, this just shows you a, a nice figure that Sander put together for a, one of these um, pro HST proposals we submitted. Um, and what this shows is basically that uh, for you can see a, a huge number of different features in these things. Um, for one source, we find uh, you know basically a multi-component structure, um, several components which are moving at different velocities, likely a merger. Um, it's in the upper left-hand corner. Um, there's a dusty clump in a different position. In some cases, we have outflows. Um, in some cases, basically, the UV is offset from the dust um, and there's offset between UV and C plus and a lot of different um, complex morphologies. And then we even find cases where we um, find some potentially neighboring galaxies. Um, we also have um, base, we're able to get uh, kinematics maps, um, trying to look at uh, the, um, even though um, our data is taken at relatively low spatial resolution, we can still uh, look at try to derive um, the dynamical structure of these objects, not only measuring the uh, line widths, but also looking for differential rotation. We can try to see if things are uh, rotation dominated or dispersion dominated. And so we've been looking at that. So Sanders been looking at that. We have a master student, uh, Juliette, um, who's been working on um, looking, at, looking at that as well. Um, and so, so yeah, so we have, a, so that's actually very exciting. You can also look at the width of the lines. We're putting this all this information together and trying to look at papers. Um, another thing that we found in our data is amazingly, we found a, a lot of cases, a number, three, at least three cases where um, we, we've also found additional other C plus lines serendipitously next to our pri primary target, which appear to be at the same redshift and appear to be um, bright nearby neighbors. So um, in one case, we find a, uh, there's a, in this, in, uh, in the left of the diagram, you can see the center of our ALMA beam where you have a nice C plus detection. But um, if you look, um, oops, sorry, if you look uh, slightly above it, you can see uh, there's also uh, another C plus line uh, just immediately to the, to the north of it. Um, and this, uh, you know, has essentially the same redshifts. And if you look at the star formation rate from this, uh, this other source, um, it basically, the star formation you get rate you get from the dust continuum detection and um, C plus are the same. And in some of these cases, again, some of these sources are completely obscured. Um, and some some of the neighbors are completely obscured in the rest UV, and some are seen in the rest UV. So you see a wide diversity. We have three neighbors, and two are obscured, and one is not. So you can see a wide variety of different objects. This could be a very interesting way of. Uh, trying to constrain uh, dust, uh, obscured star formation in the high redshift universe. Richard, We've also you have five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Is am I twenty minutes or is it uh, uh, five minutes, including questions? In including questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me just quickly zoom to the end then. Um, so. Um, in addition, we've been looking for uh, dust continuum detections. We have uh, twenty, at least twenty detections in our data. Um, at, if you consider two and a half sigma dust detection at three sigma, then we have 17. The roughly a 50% detection rate in rebels. Um, these are some of the morphologies, some of the dust detections. Um, some of them are quite significant. Some of them are spatially extended. 
Um, how, may, how, how, how has this program added to what we, what, what's been available in the literature? Um, basically, um, uh, basically, this shows you what's been available in terms of LIR versus redshift. Um, there's some sources which are greater than 10 to the 11 uh, solar masses, uh, you know, L sun per year. Uh, so this is what we've done, and this is what this program does in terms of adding to what's in the literature. So huge numbers of new dust detections, you know, increasing the number by basically a factor of uh, six or seven. We've also been getting a lot of follow-up data from this part on this. We're even getting in addition to with MOSFIRE, uh, we've been we've gotten a JVLA and NOEMA program, and we've uh, submitted large numbers of JWP programs, at least ten, um, to do all sorts of different things to look at to look for. Um, Proto clusters to look at kinematics to try to constrain um, essentially stellar mass density, et cetera. Uh, again, uh, let me just quickly go zoom to the end. Uh, lots of people to acknowledge uh, for uh, the work that's been done here. Um, thanks to Allegro, um, thanks to people who build the samples and uh, people who helped write the proposal. So, in summary, basically, um, this Rebels program has shown that ALMA is uh, a very powerful tool to constrain the properties of ga massive galaxies in the early universe. We have um, at least 28, um, um, uh, you know, uh, red, uh, C plus detections at redshift uh, six and a half and, and greater. Um, we've been able to detect dust continuum and ISM in cooling lines in well, 55 to 60 percent for the whole sample. If you for the sources were finished, 70 percent. The program is uh, basically 90 percent complete. Um, we got huge amounts of data coming in, and stay tuned for um, more results. Okay, so that's okay. So. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. 